Hey guys, in this particular video I'm going to introduce you to moment of inertia and how to calculate the kinetic energy of an object that's rotating. Let's get started. So let's say we've got an object that's rotating about say an axis right here and it's rotating with an angular velocity of omega in the counterclockwise direction. Although to be honest it doesn't matter if it was counterclockwise or, count or clockwise. And let's say we wanted to calculate the kinetic energy of this object due to rotation purely. Well, how can we calculate that? The only tool we've got in our belt so far is T, which is often used to denote kinetic energy, is equal to a half mv squared, where v is just the magnitude of your velocity vector, right? Well, how can we use this particular formula, which is tradition, which was pretty much derived for only rectilinear motion, to this rotating object? Well, it comes with the realization that this object can actually split into a bunch of smaller objects. For example, it can be split into a, a small block here, and a small block here, and a small block here, and a small block here, for example. Right? And each of these smaller blocks have their own different velocities. Right? This block may be traveling in this direction um, due to rotation, and this block may be traveling roughly in this direction, and this block might be traveling in this direction, and this block might be traveling in this direction, for example. So what we can do, it's a, a really interesting trick we can use to calculate the total kinetic energy of this object, is to split this into a whole bunch of smaller elements. Calculate the kinetic energy of each of these elements, and then sum them all up to find the total kinetic energy. I hope that makes sense. So, in, in, in fact, Let's, let's, let's do that right now by having a very, very small, in fact so small it's infinitesimally small element of mass dm, right? And let's say we wanted to calculate the kinetic energy of this small object right here. We can do that by calculating the velocity of this element. And we know that the velocity of this element is just going to be equal to the distance of the midpoint of your element towards the axis of rotation, which I'll call r, times by omega. Right? So this is just going to be r omega. This is going to be the velocity of your element. And it's going to be perpendicular to this distance to your axis of rotation right here. Right? So it's, it's going to be traveling roughly in this direction, and the velocity of your element is going to be r omega. So let's calculate what the kinetic energy of our particular element is. Well, we know that the kinetic energy of our element is just going to be equal to dt, because the element's so small. And it's going to have a kinetic energy of a half times whatever our mass is, dm, times by our velocity squared, which I recently derived was r omega squared. Right? This becomes a matter of integration now. What we can do is we can integrate both sides and realize on the left-hand side, we're left with the integral dt, and on the right hand side we're left with the integral a half dm times by r omega squared, right? And the limits of integration will be from 0 to 0 um, based off the initial condition that with no mass there's not going to be any rotational kinetic energy to our final point t and m. In other words, the, when we consider the total mass of our object, then the, then the total kinetic energy of our object will just be t. So in other words, I, I could actually write this as t rot if I wanted to. The total kinetic energy of our object of mass m as it's rotating. So that's essentially what this means, and, these were, and, and don't lose track of what these, what these limits of integration actually refer to. They refer to our boundary conditions. All right, well, we can actually integrate the left-hand side quite nicely. We, can, we know that our left-hand side is just going to evaluate into t rot, right? Our total kinetic energy of our object due to rotation is going to be equal to, and we can factor out a half and omega squared, because they're constant, not related to mass at all. And you'll be left with r squared dm with inside the integral sign. And don't forget, your limits of integration will be from 0 to your, to your total mass of your object m. Well, what, what, what we tend to do is, instead of writing out this integral every single time, we've actually denoted this as i, our moment of inertia. In other words, you can say i has been defined to be 
equal to the integral of r squared dm, right? So that's, that's your answer. That is what your moment of inertia is equal to, the integral of r squared dm from 0 to your total mass of your object m, right? And as such, you can say the kinetic energy of any rotating object, t rot, purely due to rotation, is going to be equal to a half omega squared i. Ta-da. We're not completely done yet. There are other ways you can express i as well. Notice that the definition of density is density is equal to dm dv. We can use this to simplify our moment of inertia. We can write dm is going to be equal to rho, our density, times by dv. As such, recall that our definition of moment of inertia is i is equal to the integral of r squared dm. So you can write that as r squared rho dv if you just substitute the dm. As such, your limits of integration will change from 0 to your final volume of your object, v. All right, so this is another alternate way of expressing your moment of inertia. Both are completely correct. But this later one I've derived is more useful because it's easier to calculate the kinetic energy based off its geometry rather than its distribution of mass. But both are completely fine. Both of these are correct expressions for the moment of inertia. We're pretty much done now. Let me just end with a little bit of intuition behind it. You may have heard from a few other textbooks that moment of inertia can be viewed as um, a resistance to rotation. Why is this? It sounds a little bit complicated and then the derivation must seem a little bit hard, but it's really quite simple. All it's basically saying is if an object's rotating with the same amount of kinetic energy and if I is higher, in other words, if your moment of inertia is high, that would imply purely algebraically that omega squared must be low for the same kinetic energy. This is just using this formula right here, right? Which basically says that if your moment of inertia is incredibly high, that means in order for your kinetic energy to be the same, omega squared must be lower to cancel that high out. Likewise, if I is very low, and, and these are purely relative terms right here, if I is low, that means omega squared is going to be high. So purely based off this kind of like intuition or like algebraic juggling, you can basically say that if the moment of inertia is really, really high, that means it won't rotate as fast because omega squared, meaning omega, is just going to be really, really low. So I hope that makes sense, guys. Here we've derived the moment of inertia right here. And we've also derived the total kinetic energy of any ro object that's rotating purely due to rotation. In the next couple of videos, I'll go through a few examples of how we can use these and how to calculate the um, moment of inertia too.